Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. We have something very special lined up for you tonight. And on this episode, I am joined by New York Times bestselling author Marcus Brotherton, uh, who has written a number of phenomenal Band of Brothers themed books. Uh, he has written a book about Shifty Powers. He uh, co-wrote uh, the biography, the memoirs of Buck Compton. Uh, and he's also worked with some Hollywood figures himself, which we are going to be talking about. Uh, the bulk of our conversation, though, is going to be the story and the history behind his latest book, which is entitled A Bright and Blinding Sun, a World War II story of survival, love, and redemption. And it's definitely going to be a book that you want to check out. Uh, so, Marcus, thank you so much for joining us on Real History. Thanks, Jared. It's great to be here. Great to be with all your viewers. Very good. Uh, before we talk about the book itself, which is focused a lot on the experiences of an American veteran who is captured in the Philippines in 1942. Uh, we are a history movie channel, um, after all. Uh, so I thought it would be really appropriate for us to discuss perhaps a little bit about how Bataan, the Death March, the Philippines, the plight of American POWs and survivors have been depicted in film uh, over the years. Uh, and so I, I suppose it would be appropriate to start at the beginning because certainly the exploits of these Americans were well known back here in the States in the 1940s. Uh, and I, I think one that, that we had uh, mentioned earlier in some of our previous conversa uh, conversations is uh, John Ford's They Were Expendable, uh, which is about uh, PT boats in the South Pacific in the opening days of the Second World War. Um, what, what, how in your mind does this film speak to you? Uh, and how does it possibly relate to some of the themes that you explore in your book? Some call it an escape, some call it a betrayal. It's early spring 1942 and MacArthur is the big dog in the Pacific. So MacArthur is sent to Australia. Again, some call it escape, some call it betrayal. The point is that MacArthur leaves his troops in the Philippines to fight for themselves. And this is captured so well in John Ford's movie, uh, John Wayne is the main actor. And it captures the humanity and the feelings of betrayal that many of the troops felt when MacArthur left. General Wainwright is put in charge and General Wainwright He's kind of known to be uh, too old for the job, uh, even washed out. He likes to, to tip a cork, and he's put in charge. Fortunately, the men like Wainwright, they're going to stay and fight because they have no other choice. Yeah, those are some, some really good insights. Uh, and, you know, there were a number of other uh, movies that are perhaps slightly lesser known because they didn't have John Wayne caliber star power in them. But um, when I was young, I, I recall a a Tyrone Power film called An American Guerrilla in the Philippines, uh, which uh, showed a, a naval officer, I believe, who stuck behind and fought it out with the Filipinos over the next few years. Uh, and in, in more recent years, it's about 15 years ago now, uh, I suppose, uh, there is another movie, which is kind of the bookend to They Were Expendable, uh, and that is The Great Raid. Have, have you ever seen the movie The Great Raid? Uh, the Great Raid, uh, of course, based on Hampton Side's book, um, Ghost Soldiers is the name of the book. Absolutely, read the book before you see the movie. Both are great. Uh, it's about the quest to liberate uh, 500 American POWs who are, who are uh, incarcerated on, on Bataan. Uh, the movie uh, stars Benjamin Bratt and Connie Nielsen is this American nurse who's joining up with, with, with the Filipino resistance fighters. Uh, fantastic action. Uh, spoiler alert, it is a happy ending uh, to, this, uh, to this movie. And as we know, just so many stories from that era didn't have happy endings, uh, which is not so much a criticism as an observation. Definitely go see the movie, read the book first. Uh, several other films from the, the early era, uh, Jared, are undoubtedly worth mentioning. Uh, 
Um, so proudly we hail 1943 really shows the, uh, the, the pathos of the era. It's, it's a story about nurses who are trapped on Bataan. Um, a little bit of a romantic movie and yet uh, definitely worth seeing to study the era. And then I'm also thinking of uh, 1945 Back to Bataan. Uh, really shows the plight of the civilians in the era. I think uh, switching again to modern movies, probably one of the observations is there is that there is a dearth of modern movies that really capture the Pacific uh, in its entirety and, and the action and the, the heartbreak of the era. Certainly HBO's uh, The Pacific, the miniseries, fantastic miniseries, uh, bloody, difficult to watch in places, and yet definitely worth watching. And I, I think that's a, a great segue for discussing your book, uh, which I certainly think is, is movie worthy. Uh, so uh, I, I'm interested in how you found out uh, about this, this subject. Uh, and so it's about a veteran by the name of Joe Johnson, uh, who has a, a rather incredible story uh, starting at a very, very young age. Um, so perhaps you can introduce us to Joe a little bit and uh, outline some of his adventures or misadventures along the way for us without giving too much away. So right when COVID hit, um, more than two and a half years ago now, I guess, um, I was in my office, I had gathered this stack of really obscure World War II manuscripts to read uh, while I was kind of hunkered down in my office. And you know, who doesn't love a good obscure World War II manuscript? So about halfway down the pile, there was the um, originally published uh, memoir of Joseph Johnson. And he had, uh, he had written this, uh, uh, oh, probably 15, 20 years ago, published it independently in 2010. And a fascinating book, uh, read it straight through cover to cover, um, and, and just loved it. Had a, had a, it was kind of all over the place, kind of rambling, but it had this lyrical quality to it. Uh, Joe only had a seventh grade education himself, and yet, boy, he was poetic in how he spoke and just the uh, amazing sort of twists of words. And uh, so after I read it, um, and, and the story itself was just, was just so fantastic, so almost unbelievable in its, in its uh, poignancy and yet in, in its action and, and sort of this overlay of horror and yet this ribbon of love that ran through it. So I, um, after I read the, the manuscript, I reached out to the family uh, just to convey my thanks. Joe had actually passed away in 2017, age 91, but his family kept this very, very kind of tiny Facebook page. Uh, and so I reached out to them just to convey, you know, wow, what a fantastic story. Um, thank you so much. And uh, to my surprise, they responded uh, very quickly and they said, uh, hey, we recognize you. We know your name. Uh, you've written some books. Um, we really want Joe's story to get out to a broader audience. Uh, let's talk. And so we began to discuss a retelling of Joe's story, uh, researching it again and, and comparing it with after action reports and just making sure everything's 100% uh, true and then just see if we can get this book out there. And that started this process uh, uh, toward my book. It just goes to prove that you never know when or where or through what means your next story or your next book is going to be dropped in your lap. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's very serendipitous, but I have no doubt that perhaps it was meant to be. Now, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, how how, how well told the story was that this was a man who had a strong voice and he used that strong voice to convey this story. Uh, but his story in the book doesn't necessarily start out with a strong voice. And that gets us into one of these repetitive challenges that he has to confront throughout his life, particularly pertaining to fear. Um, so I wondered if, if you can highlight that pivotal moment when he is a child uh, that is kind of a foundation for your story. When I began to dig into the estate archives, um, I found just a wealth of information and there were extra stories in there and Joe had left behind uh, journals and poems he had written and emails and correspondences and just uh, and, and photos. 
um, just a, a fantastic uh, array and assortment of, of uh, tributes to this man's life that, that he had left. Uh, there was also, um, there was actually two different manuscripts that I worked from. Um, the, the, the one that I had initially um, was, was Joe's self-published manuscript. There was actually an earlier manuscript that he had written before that that was so rare, even the estate didn't have it. Uh, I was able to track down a copy. There was only uh, three known copies in existence. And I was able to uh, compare and contrast these first two uh, manuscripts that Joe had written. Uh, the, the fascinating piece here is that one was written in first person and the other was written in third person. First person, I did this, I did that. Third person, Joe did this, Joe did that. And, and the third person manuscript was the earlier version. It's almost as if Joe was just um, still, still working through the emotion of the story himself and couldn't write about himself unless he wrote sort of detached from himself. Uh, anyway, within that um, great pile of, of uh, uh, information that Joe had left, and, and audio tapes and videotapes as well, uh, there was this sort of a short story, True, uh, called uh, The Little Bird. And Joe had actually wanted to title his self-published manuscript The Little Bird, but people didn't think it sounded, uh, you know, sort of military uh, strength enough. Um, but anyway, uh, a true story that happened to him, second grade, he's seven years old at Christine Elementary School in Memphis, Tennessee. And all the students in his classroom have been tasked by their teacher to write an original poem and then uh, memorize it and then recite it uh, in front of um, parents and grandparents and friends and family uh, who all come in for this, you know, special performance. So uh, Joe gets up there and actually he can read the poem. Um, and he, he stands in front of all these people and uh, his throat is dry and his heart is hammering and he gets out uh, the first line, once there was a little bird, and then he stops and that's as far as he can go. Stage fright overtakes him and, and he can't get out, uh, uh, just, he can't get out anything at all and seconds are sort of ticking by like forever and finally the teacher uh, sort of steps in and says, gives him this prompt and says, uh, and what was the little bird doing, dear? And Joe just blurts out, he was walking down the road, just walking down the road. And of course, the whole class just erupts in laughter. And, and Joe is crushed. He, he can't get out the whole poem, and, and everyone's kind of laughing, either with him or at him. He doesn't know, but he feels like they're laughing at him. And so he hangs his head, he sits down, the damage is done. But, and this is key, this resolve begins to form in his heart. And the resolve is this, Never again give in to fear. You know, there's just a huge application for us uh, to this because so many things in life um, contain fear and yet they're opportunities. You know, should we take this new job? Should we move to this new city? You know, if we're still single, should we date this girl? Should we call her up and ask her out? And, and it's very tempting to give in to fear. And yet if we ado adopt a similar resolve that no, we will not give in to fear, then uh, good opportunities can come our way. Yeah, that's very well said. And indeed, resolve is, is one of those universal themes that is applicable to any time period or, or circumstance. I think that's why uh, people will really enjoy this book. Uh, but while we're on the topic of resolve, uh, a mere seven years after he has that epiphany, uh, he embarks on the next great chapter of his life at a very premature age, I think one could argue. Um, what was that next big pivot point in his life and where did it take him and who did he meet along the way? So it's a true story. Uh, Joe is 12 years old. He's living with his mother and his two younger siblings in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's not a very good situation. It's still at the tail end of the Great Depression. Money is very scarce. Uh, the mother has a job on the other side of town. She's kind of gone uh, from the household from uh, dawn to dusk. And Joe is the man of, of the family at 12 years old, trying to take care of these two little uh, younger siblings and get them enough coal in, in, in the wintertime and enough food. And the mother's job just, there isn't enough money to go around. And uh, Joe's father has taken off to Texas looking for work, but it's resulted in a divorce. Uh, and so Joe's mother has taken up with a one-legged barkeep named Mr. Jake, who's now also out of work and 
spends most of the days uh, lounging around the house when he's actually you know looking for work but he's really uh, on the couch and so tension grows in the household it's a very difficult time for this young boy who feels upon himself and takes upon himself the weight of the world uh, tension grows in particular between mr jake and Joe. And finally it comes to a point where Joe thinks to himself, you know what, I think uh, everybody would just be better off if I was out of here. So one night he uh, slips out of his room and steals down to the railway station and jumps aboard a train that's headed for Texas. Joe is um, running away intent upon finding his father. Uh, as the story goes, eventually he does find his father, fortunately, and it's a pretty good reunion. Um, Joe lives with his father for the next two years. His father works as a itinerant uh, horse trainer, uh, but tension begins to grow there as well. Joe is skipping school, and he's not really in school, and uh, boys his age aren't supposed to be down at the track, and finally his father sits him down and gives him an ultimatum, and he looks as, you know, you can go here, you can go here, or you can go here but you can't stay with me. What's it going to be? And Joe just sort of blurts out, well, maybe I'll just join the army then. And Joe means it as a bluff, uh, but that night when Joe goes to bed, he begins to think about this idea. And he's like, you know, maybe that's not such a bad idea at all. And so uh, still in the middle of the night, he, he <laughs> leaves his room again, runs away again, uh, makes his way to Pasadena, where he finds a, a, a recruiting office uh, early next morning that's open. Joe um, swears on a stack of Bibles that he's 18. The recruiter doesn't quite believe him because he looks so young. And yet, uh, Joe gets lost in the shuffle. He gets lost in the paperwork. He says his birth certificate is back in, in Memphis, uh, where he was born. In reality, he was born in, Louis in Louisiana, moved to uh, Memphis when he was two years old. So, uh, obviously, there's no internet back in those days. And so, it's just a whole lot easier for a kid that age to get lost in the shuffle. Joe finds himself uh, joining the army. And here he is, 14 years old, and he is thrust into this world of adulthood that he knows nothing about. Yeah, it, it, you know, and you definitely uh, speak to truth there. I know of, of one Marine, when I worked at Gettysburg National Military Park, I became aware of a young Marine who's buried in the National Cemetery there, um, a young Marine by the name of Paul Heller. Uh, and he was killed in action at age 16. Uh, and it's in the realm of possibility that he's the youngest American combatant to die in, in the Second World War. And so, uh, true to your point, uh, in the days before Google and federal electronic databases, um, it was much, much easier for individuals to get away with enlisting at, at such a young age. When Joe arrives in the Philippines, uh, at a time when most teenagers are learning how to drive or get their permits. Uh, he encounters his first case of love, and then not too long after that, he is thrust into the chaos of combat for the first time. I'm wondering if you can speak to kind of this emotional roller coaster that he finds himself on in 1942, and how that, how that molded him at this very young age. Yeah, it's spring and summer, uh, 1941. Keep in mind that this is before Pearl Harbor. Um, Joe's just turned 15 by then. He's been through boot camp. He's been sent to the Philippines. And, you know, really he should be going to his freshman prom or maybe his sophomore prom at high school. Uh, but here he is, you know, shooting uh, expert marksmen at, at the riflery range. And Joe is, is uh, put in this subculture of very um, uh, strong masculinity, uh, sometimes tough masculinity. He's hanging out with these uh, young men who are 18 to 25 for the most part, and some of them are older. Some of them have been in the Philippines for a long time. They've kind of settled into the, into the culture there. And so um, Joe has not had many uh, exemplary um, uh, male figures in his life. You know, his father has been here and there, and and and. Mr. Jake, his stepfather, has, has certainly been kind of a, a lounge about. And so Joe is looking to these older men. What do you do? How do you become a man? It's, it's how do you transition from being a boy into a man? And there's uh, one fairly large piece of the story where, uh, you know, sometimes soldiers uh, do this. Um, they, the, the older soldiers go to a brothel. And Joe, young Joe, goes with them in tow. Uh, 
Uh, you know, it, it, it's a difficult part of the story, and certainly we don't condone this type of activity, um, but it happens, and it's, it's a true piece of history. So Joe goes to this brothel, and there he meets a young uh, worker in the brothel whose name is Perpetua. Now, she becomes a very fascinating piece of the story because, it, as it turns out, she's actually a year younger than Joe. And as the story goes, she is an orphan. And um, tragically, there just weren't a whole lot of options. Boy, if you were female and an orphan in that era, uh, weren't a whole lot of options for you if you wanted to keep eating, if you wanted to keep living. And so Joe and Perpetua, they do consummate their relationship the first time they meet. But then they meet another half dozen times as Joe returns to her. And it becomes purely platonic. It's just a friendship. And it's a wonderful friendship between Joe and Perpetua that develops. And, and Perpetua really becomes uh, Joe's only female peer in, in that piece of the world. And so she is meeting this incredible uh, need in his life, uh, assuaging the loneliness that he feels, uh, giving him friendship. And Joe begins to develop empathy. He begins to see the world through her eyes. And in one piece of the book he says, you know, she might have been a prostitute halfway around the world, but she was important. She was important. And so um, Perpetua actually becomes pregnant at one point, and pregnant prostitutes had it even rougher uh, in, in that uh, time. And so Joe begins to scheme, how can he get Perpetua out of the brothel and to safety? And this is a big piece of the story uh, that I'll let you read in the book. And of course, throughout much of the book, uh, there's just one challenge after another. Uh, especially after the Philippines fall to the Japanese. And uh, so much of what you say, I think, resonates today or should resonate today. We've talked about resolve. We've talked about overcoming challenges. We've talked about empathy. Uh, the whole world could use a little bit more empathy um, in, in our current age. Uh, but there's also this sublime notion of friendship. Uh, throughout your story. Uh, friendships and partnerships uh, made not just out of being buddy with somebody, but also out of survival. Um, so I'm wondering um, if you could offer a little bit of testimony as to the, the friendships and the bonds that Joe forms, not only through combat, but also being a prisoner of war for a long time as well. Spring 1942, uh, of course, uh, Bataan falls, Corregidor, the island off the mainland, falls about a month later. And uh, General Wainwright uh, runs up the, the, the white flag. The entire uh, population of, of, of the American troops surrender, and, and along with the many Filipino troops as well. And so Joe is incarcerated uh, as a teenager. He's put into these very horrific POW camps. And um, really there's a series of different camps that he goes to throughout the next several years. Uh, one of the first ones he's put in is Bilibid Prison in the heart of Manila. Now Bilibid, Bilibid uh, you know, it's still, uh, it's still a horrific environment. And it, it's relatively uh, easier compared to some of the other ones. There's some American doctors and, and surgeons who are in Bilibid and they have uh, just a few uh, you know, drugs left to fight some of the diseases and whatnot. Uh, the prisoners are eating in Bilibid, um, and they're doing labor, but it's not super, super hard labor. So Bilibid, you can survive it. Okay. After that, Joe is transferred to Nichols Field. Nichols Field is one of the worst of the worst. Uh, the prisoners there are tasked with moving an airfield by hand. Uh, Japanese want this airfield built, and so it's pick and shovel work and boxcar work. And, uh, and, and, and there's tremendous pressure now upon the uh, Japanese commandant of Nichols Field uh, because, you know, the enemy wants this uh, airfield up and running so they can land their planes on it and take off. And so the commandant is putting pressure on the guards and the guards are putting pressure on the prisoner. And so the, the whole atmosphere is just ramped up and very, very intense. There's beatings, uh, there's uh, executions. Uh, Joe, by this point, um, in his incarceration, is sick. He's got uh, uh, scurvy and bearberry, and he's got this persistent case of malaria. Every day he's running a fever, every night. His weight is dropping. His weight is dropping while he's growing. 
uh, and, and one day Joe gets beaten for a, a very small infraction. He survives the beating, but he begins to realize he's not going to make it. He's not going to survive Bilibid. What is he going to do? So he remembers that in that particular subculture, uh, the Japanese um, didn't want to do, didn't want anything to do with people who had gone crazy, you know, mentally uh, not altogether. And, and in that subculture, uh, mental illness was something to be feared. So, so Joe begins to, to scheme and think, and he, and he thinks to himself, if I can just get transferred back to Bilibid, there's some American surgeons there. They'll have uh, some, some sulfur drugs and whatever I need to you know, cure my diseases. We were eating better at Bilibid. We weren't, uh, we weren't worked as hard. If I can just get sent back to Bilibid. So he undertakes this um, just a horrific plan. Uh, one of his very few possessions is a spoon, part of his canteen kit. And every day he begins to sharpen this spoon. There's a stone in, in the latrine, and every time he goes to the latrine, he's sharpening this spoon. So finally, the, the day of his big performance comes, and he takes a spoon, and he rushes into this group of Japanese guards, and he begins to slice his arms. He slices his arms till they're bleeding. He's yelling um, insults at the Japanese, yelling his, his foolish head off, as he, as he says. He takes the blood from his arms, he rubs it on his face, and he shouts, I'm crazy! Well, the Japanese guards, they, they, they hog tie him. Uh, they leave him tied on this dirt in, in the field all day long. And then they, they trudge him back to the, uh, the Passe schoolhouse where the, the prisoners are staying for the night. Uh, but instead of being put in quarters, Joe is put in what's called an ISO. And an ISO is this little coffin-like box. Uh, a prisoner can't stand, a prisoner can't lie down, a prisoner is put in a fetal position in this box, slatted wood box. And uh, to Joe's knowledge, I mean his heart just sinks because to his knowledge nobody has ever survived the ISO. And so a day goes by and another day goes by and there's no food and there's no water. And another day goes by and, and some, of the, some of the guards take turns poking him through the slatted uh, you know, box with, with these wooden prods. And Joe begins to hallucinate and he's thinking, you know, I, I may as well be crazy because I'm not going to survive this ISO. He remembers this, uh, the words to a Methodist prayer he learned as a boy. He, Joe was not a religious guy at all at this point in his life. But he begins to just to pray this one prayer, God have mercy, God have mercy. You know, one of the amazing pieces of the story is that the, the heavens part, so to speak, and rain begins to fall. And Joe is able to stick his, his head in, in between the slats and get some rainwater, and that's enough to keep him alive. Well, finally, he's delirious, and, he, and he, all he can detect is that he is being taken out of the ISO and thrown to the back of this truck. He's bounced along this road. And then the next thing he remembers is opening his eyes and he sees the face of an American doctor. Joe has made it back to Bilibid Prison. <laughs> his audacious plan has worked. So that's the kind of forgiveness we're talking about here. You know, can you forgive an enemy who has done this to you, who has beaten you, who has insulted you? You know, we, we all have times that we've all been hurt. And yet this is the, this is the, the challenge of us all. As Joe learns later in life, um, he comes home from the war and he's still filled with anger and filled with rage. And, and the anger and the rage, uh, you know, certainly aren't doing anything for him. N nothing at all. Uh, all that succeeds in doing is making him more angry. He goes through a few different marriages. He can't hold a job back at home. Uh, he's not a, a very good father initially. And, and finally gets to the place where he is, uh, he checks himself into a psych ward. This is kind of middle age for him. And uh, we don't know exactly what happened in that psych ward, but as Joe says, those doctors there, those psychologists there, they, uh, they, they straighten my brain out. Uh, they, they got a hold of my butt and they straightened my brain out, he says. And, and when, he, when he left uh, the hospital, he talks about how he had learned to forgive. In Joe's words, he had learned how to set that, that hurt down. Uh, we, we don't quite know if Joe had, had forgiven completely or if he had extended forgiveness, you know, because sometimes it's hard because the enemy is not going to come to you and, and apologize. But as Joe says, I wasn't going to hold it against them anymore. I wasn't going to hold on to this hate. I was going to set this burden down and set it down again. Forgiveness, a huge piece of this story. Yeah, wow. I mean, there's just so much to, to learn and to absorb from 
this story. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, before we segue off to something else real quick, uh, check out the book once more, A Bright and Blinding Sun. And uh, before we go, Marcus, uh, I would be remiss um, if we didn't talk about one of your other collaborations. Uh, and that is the book Grateful American, which you co-author with none other than Gary Sinise. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we've, we've taken a look at, at the movie uh, Forrest Gump uh, here on our channel. And I think it, it's quite evident that him playing Lieutenant Dan was one of these life-changing roles uh, because you know it, it kind of brings us back to that idea of empathy because by playing a double amputee in a movie uh, it, it certainly raised his awareness and his consciousness of some of the struggles that our veterans have had to endure over the past several decades. Um, so I'm wondering um, if, if you could perhaps uh, draw a line between your most recent book and Grateful American and having these sorts of revelations come to light. It was an absolute privilege to work with Gary Sinise. He's Oscar nominated, nominated actor. Uh, we've seen him in Forrest Gump. We've seen him in Apollo 13. Uh, of course, the CSI New York. Uh, so Gary has, uh, he's still acting, um, but for the most part, he's transitioned from actor to advocate. And he runs the Gary Sinise Foundation. Uh, which is uh, very big and very influential. They build um, adaptive smart homes for severely wounded veterans. Uh, they work with uh, Gold Star spouses and Gold Star children, um, just really helping put hope back in their lives. <clears throat> and then he also, uh, he has the Lieutenant Dan Band. Uh, he's kind of today's Bob Hope. He's um, traveling around the United States to various uh, military bases and overseas just to entertain the troops. Uh, Gary Sneeze, I can't say enough good about him. He is the real deal. Well said. And I think whether we look at somebody like Joe Johnson or Gary Sinise, there's a lot that we can learn about being good Americans and good human beings. Uh, and so with, with those thoughts in mind, I, I once again encourage everybody to head out to your nearest bookstore or Amazon and check out a bright and blinding sun. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us here on Real History. This was something new for us uh, to experiment, but I'm, I'm so glad we could have this conversation. And uh, I, I certainly hope uh, this book might be turned into a movie someday. Who would you like to play Joe in the film if it ever came to that? Uh, Jared, I was uh, wondering if you were going to ask me that question, um, and I, I actually I, I sent an email out to my good friend Tosca Lee, who's a novelist. She said uh, Chase Stokes from Outer Outer Banks apparently is the one to watch. I sent another email out to uh, to uh, the executor of, of the Joe Johnson estate, and he said uh, Ty Sheridan, who is in uh, uh, Ready Player One and, and Mud with with uh, Matthew McConaughey. Uh, I, I kind of like Tom Holland from Spider-Man, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not complaining. I think if there is a movie made of this book, it's going to be great any way you look at it. All right. Well, we'll keep the conversation going. So, Marcus, thank you once again. Thanks, Jared. It's been a, a real pleasure to be here. And that has it for this episode of Real History. Join us next time as we continue to separate fact from fiction and we continue to look at myths and movies. We'll see you next time.